My name is Dimitri Broxton. I'm the Senior Director of Education at MOAD in San Francisco. Uh, our building is still closed um, as we undergo a refresh of our galleries. We will be opening on October 20th, so mark your calendars. Uh, please be there. Um, again, October 20th is our open day, and it's going to be so exciting. Um, but we, you know, during this time since March 2020 that we've been closed, we wanted to make sure that folks still got uh, their fill of art and artists of the African diaspora. So twice a month, you can join myself or my colleague, Elena Gross, as we visit some of our favorite artists and hear from them in their studios to see what they're currently working on. It's a rare opportunity to hear from artists directly from their studios. And as always, we follow each of our talks with an audience Q&A. So if you're joining us on Zoom, you'll see the little Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Please make sure to enter questions in there uh, so that I can get to them in the last 15 minutes of the conversation. Or if they're applicable, I'll get to them even earlier <laughs> if they directly relate to what we're talking about at the moment. If you are joining us from Facebook, please also enter your questions and comments. Uh, Sade is with us in the background and she will be transferring them over to Zoom so I will be able to see those. Um, you can visit our website, www.moadsf.org to see which artists we have coming up. Um, and we also, uh, we archive these on our YouTube channel. So look up Museum of the African Diaspora on YouTube. Um, they're also archived on our Facebook. This series was made possible by generous donations by the Westridge Foundation, the California Humanities, National Endowment for the Humanities, all of our MOAD members, um, and all of you who join each week. Thank you so much. We couldn't do it without you. I'm gonna read a couple statements before I introduce my guest today. MOAD stands in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. We honor and mourn the senseless murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Dante Wright, Micaiah Bryant, and the countless uh, others who have lost their lives at the hands of police brutality and racial injustice, including those whose names we do not know. MOAD's commitment to racial justice is ongoing, and as such, we will continue to say their names to hold space and honor these victims. We also uh, remember that all non-native people to this land are descended from settler occupiers or those who were brought against their will. Moad occupies the unceded land of the Ramatush Ohlone people, and we pay our respects to the Ohlone people and our elders, both, both past and present. Um, if you would like to know more information about the native inhabitants of the land that you occupy, we invite you to visit www dot native hyphen land dot ca and you can enter your zip code and find out much more about them and get involved. My guest today is Lorenzo Baker. Uh, Lorenzo is an artist living and working in Los Angeles, California. His art practice explores the formal ways in which language and image construct our understanding of history and contemporary culture. Working with ready-made objects and other recognizable materials such as historical documents, images, and video, Lorenzo Baker's art practice is invested in the interplay between expectation and assumption. By disrupting the universal truths found in everyday materials and archetypal language, the artworks produced offer viewers an alternative way of looking. Lorenzo is a graduate of Dillard University and Otis College of Art and Design in 2018. His artwork has been in Los, uh, shown in Los Angeles, California, New Orleans, Louisiana, and Sacramento, California. Lorenzo, it's my pleasure to have you today. Thank you, thank you. I'm really honored and happy to be here. Yeah, how's, how's everything going? You're in, I mean, I can see the sunlight coming through the window. You're in sunny LA. Um, <laughs> how's everything going for you? Everything's going pretty well, you know. Um, this is just kind of like an amazing moment. Uh, so right now I am at my studio. So this is kind of how it looks. I do have a lot of really big windows. It's great. You know, I'm in downtown Los Angeles. And, um, you know, I guess it's just another month in America. So <laughs> keep it going. <laughs> so, so I understand you graduated in 2018. You were doing a little bit of, of teaching. Um, you know, until COVID came along. Uh, <laughs> can you, can you, can you kind of tell us a little bit about that? What are you up to? I love talking to fellow educators. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I have kind of always been involved in the education aspects of the art world. Um, so, you know, two years ago, I graduated from Otis College of Art and Design, got my MFA in painting and drawing. Um, and right after I graduated, I started working at the Armory, which is uh, an institution in Pasadena. Um, and, you know, they focus on arts and education. So I was doing a lot of uh, teaching there. Um, they have like a really amazing teaching program. I was a part of it. And it mostly focuses on, you know, K through 12. So from, you know, young babies to high schoolers. And, you know, we're really tasked with engaging them with how to make art, how to think about what is art, um, how to incorporate art into their lives, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of what I've been doing. And then, yeah, just like you said, um, I was doing that up until the beginning of the pandemic. Everything kind of shifted and changed. Um, a lot of these places, you know, shut down because they're in person and, you know, there was this huge transitionary period. And, um, you know, I kind of just came out of that as, you know, no longer teaching at an institution, but more so just being a full-time artist. So mm -hmm. I pretty much wake up and make art every day. Oh my gosh, I want to hear all about that. So, you know, I mean, you, you, we, we often hear about how COVID came along and kind of took away opportunities for folks. But at least in my vision, at least the way I hear it <laughs> and imagine it, it seems like uh, it seems like the pandemic kind of opened up this opportunity for you to, um, as I say, take the leap to being a full time artist. Um, how has that been for you? It's it's different, you know, and I think the pandemic has kind of put a new seasoning or flavor on top of the whole <laughs> experience. You know, because prior to that, you know, I, I would consider myself a full-time artist before then, but obviously, you know, sometimes you have to pay the bills. So mm -hmm. uh, you have a job or you work for someone, or you do what you have to do. Uh, but I think it has given me the opportunity to fully let go. You know, a lot of those ideas were on the mental side of things. So like, mm -hmm. I'm a full-time artist, regardless of if I'm working here or doing this. I'm always thinking about art. I'm always thinking about my practice, you know, the things that are important to me, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but, you know, I'm also here doing this, punching the clock. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's changed. You know, I'm no longer beholden to those uh, responsibilities. And I'm just trying to really make an impact. You know, this is maybe one of the few times, at least in my lifetime, where I've had the opportunity to just fully express myself, you know, not really have any barriers to entry, any sort of restrictions, all these things. So it's been great. And I would also say that the pandemic has kind of given me the opportunity to see things differently as far as um, how to make work, where to make work, what types of works to make, you know, um, so many different things have happened between uh, the beginning of 2020 and now, mm -hmm. right? So many social things, the environment, et cetera, et cetera. So as an artist, I'm, I'm very in tune with those things that are going on. And I really just want to make works, yeah, that have an impact, you know, mm. that really give people an opportunity to parse out some of the, some of the world that we're experiencing. So, so, so you said, you know, kind of it's, it's changed your view uh, on, on, on things related to your art, you know? Um, so can, can you say what some of those things are? I mean, I know obviously social distancing has changed, you know, the, the ability for people to gather, at least in the numbers that, you know, they were able to, um, from kind of looking through your portfolio, it feels like your work doesn't necessarily rely on a crowd of people, right? It's so, so it's not, it's not like um, a, a big film production where you need to have like 200 people in one space or something like that. Um, but you know, how, in, in what kinds of ways do you think that, that your work has, has changed? Um, and then yeah, even I the mean, thinking about making the work. Right, yeah, I would say that location has been a really uh, big 
place for me to really kind of uh, play around, you know, make works. Um, I've been really thinking about sight, like where the mm. works actually should be experienced. I think oftentimes, you know, we have this idea that art only happens in like galleries or white boxes or, you know, museums and they have mm -hmm. all these, uh, conditions um, on top of it that, you know, give the work legitimacy for folks. And that's not really as real as it once was, right? You can only have so many people in a room now or at all. And maybe the works or maybe art should be in different places. Maybe it should happen somewhere else. So that's kind of what I've been doing, just making works outside, really. Oh no way. So so kind of like guerrilla art or or is it or is it just more like public or or the, the outside of spaces? Um just responding to the 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 environment that that kind of is Los Angeles. So you know, I don't really want to give a lot of it away because, <laughs> and that's kind of what's exciting about it. And then also kind of a part of my practice overall is, you know, I really try to make artworks that have their own life outside of the artist. So you don't necessarily need to know who made it mm. um, or that's not really as important for me. And um, yeah, maybe some of the works need to live in a park or they can only happen um, on like a street corner. So, you know, that's kind of it. Just trying to really give the works their own breath, their own. Oh, I love that. I, lo I love that concept. That, you know, that reminds me, I was just listening to a podcast, uh, Carrie Mae Weems has one where she's talking about David Hammonds. Um, I don't know if you've, if you've heard that one. Um, is it through no, the Whitney? Did, okay. Was that? I haven't heard it. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I love David Hammonds, but I, I never really realized that, you know, he, he didn't want to be associated with his artwork initially. He, um, you know, that was something from uh, Carrie's podcast that I was like, oh, that's, that's, that's different. Like he, in a, in a lot of ways, is and still, you know, was and still is a shapeshifter and the materials that he uses, um, and even his his mode of production so that I mean I, I don't know there, there's something about him where it's like when you see one of his works you know it's one of his works but you know sometimes when he's switching mediums or location you don't necessarily know that that it's him and then of course you know once you notice that it's a David Hammonds and you find that out you know you start to make associations because you know the rest of his work you know some of his thought processes um, and I think it, I, I think it, it has the power to kind of change uh, the perception or the meaning of a piece when, once you know who the artist is. So I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm curious, you know, with that, if that is, you know, you were talking about art just living on its own and not necessarily having an association with you. Um, you know, I, I wonder if that's a similar take that 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 you have on it, where. Um, because, you know, because there is like, as, as I'm having the interview with you and, uh, and as I start to learn about your life and your interests and your viewpoints, you know, you know, I think it's similar to a way where someone's like, oh, you're a black artist. So your work must be about blackness. It must have something to do with slavery. Like, is that, is that kind of that separation of allowing the work to live on its own, um, you know, part and parcel to, to kind of that, like, the work needs to speak on its own and it does not have to be super attached to your own bi you know, biography or can, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I, you know, I guess I could first say, you know, David Hammonds is a really amazing artist, um, love his work. And I also just think about art as intrinsic and sometimes it's not actually there. And what's kind of interesting is I've always had this thought about artwork is kind of uh, dead on arrival for lack of a <laughs> term. And the only way, you know, it actually becomes this kind of like capital A art is through uh, time and contemplation. So people have to kind of sit with something to really decide what's happening, um, its significance, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, you know, it doesn't always happen as soon as the work is made. So I kind of am 
really interested in maybe just producing things that exist or don't exist or are not always present. You know, you could make something that maybe only five people see. And that's mm. really cool to me because, you know, you're kind of, as an artist, you're sharing a lot of personal stuff with folks, you know, your viewpoints, your ideas, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes that gets uh, modified uh, when you have to show it in a certain way. Mm -hmm. So if you don't really limit yourself, you kind of have the opportunity to then fully, you, you can give your full expression, which is really exciting. Um, and yeah, mystery is always kind of fun. And, um, <laughs> you know, something that's really interesting is I'm really into like Afrofuturism, just as a way of thinking and just a mode of thought. And um, I've started to really consider myself like an Afrophysicist. Mm. So dealing with the dealing with physics through kind of a um, a black or Pan African uh, filter, and I think what it does for me as an artist, or at least uh, as a way to make anything, is it expands you know ideas of possibility, what is real, what is the correct orientation of something, all of these things that we kind of uh, place upon things, place upon people, et cetera, et cetera. And um, yeah, it kind of just helps me, you know, break out of that. And, um, you know, obviously there's also on maybe like a deeper level, you know, some sort of cosmic energy that's happening to us, happening upon us. And, you know, maybe part of my art practice is being like a fisherman or something, like just the person with the net catching these ideas. Um, so yeah, 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 yeah. I love, I love that. I wanna see that in your bio. <laughs> that is awesome. I I, and I just, I even love the, uh, you know, the visuals of you being the fisherman and fishing, you know, the galaxy <laughs> and kind of yeah. pulling these ideas together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause you know, what's wild about a lot of the works is, you know, they deal with every made or ready-made objects, everyday mm -hmm. things. Um, and it's like, where do you find those things? How do you, um, how do you actually conjure up, say like um, a basketball, right? Do you go and buy one from the store? Um, a lot of things that I make works out of, I find, mm -hmm. you know, so I get them for free, usually pick them up off the streets or somewhere else. Um, and, yeah, it's weird because it's like, who knew who knew I, Lorenzo, was going to run into this thing that would be perfect for this artwork? You know, it has to be a little bit deeper than just, you know, aesthetics and beauty. Mm. So. That, that, that's awesome. Um, before we go into showing any of your work, I would, I would love to hear a little bit about your path to becoming an artist. Um, you know, what, what was... When did you know that, you know, being an artist was the right move for you? Um, and also, can you, can you recall that first piece that you, that you created where you're like, yes, <laughs> this, mm. this, this is the thing for me. I, I need to, I need to go on this wild journey to become an artist. Yeah, 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 yeah. I guess it's kind of been a personal internal struggle in a lot of ways. Uh, and maybe it's because of social norms so, you know, I identify as like a black man and, um, you know, people will tell you straight up, they'll be like, uh, you know, don't do anything in the creative industry. There's no jobs for you or um, don't make stuff like this because certain people won't buy it or, mm. um, you know, people will really try to put you in a box and say, you can't, you can't, you can't. So for a while as a creative person, which I think I've maybe been all my life, um, I really wanted to be like a high fashion photographer, you know, that oh. kind of like made sense. Like, okay, I could take photos of people. My work would be seen by a lot of folks, um, you know, and, and hey, I can maybe be at the beach and like shoot this really cool scene or something. Um, but I think there was a really interesting moment during my undergrad years where I had this kind of like social break. And so when I, 
did go to Dillard, which is HBCU, New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, amazing school, a lot of great history in the art world that doesn't always get talked about. Um, but when I was there, I was like a business management major. Wow. And I had this really, <laughs> I had this really interesting moment between my mom and myself the first week of school when I was like registering for classes, doing the whole enrollment thing. And I really wanted to major in visual art. Mm. And, you know, we had like that conversation that you have like with a parent and like a child. And we landed on that I could double major, but I had to major in something that was like, quote unquote, serious or uh, something that was with the paycheck. You know, getting a job, right? Some sort of like uh, stability, you know, stable job or whatever. Um, and what happened is I never actually got the opportunity to double major. I think I got swept up in the HBCU life and, you know, was having a really good time. But then like my last year, it kind of hit me. It was like, whoa, you know, I miss being creative. I miss making mm. art. I miss kind of doing that. So I kind of decided, I don't really know the exact date, but I made this, mo this, cho this conscious choice to try to take as many art classes as I could, whether I was taking them, uh, you know, legally or not, or anything <laughs> like that. Um, and I was just gonna really try to gain as much knowledge as I can, like as a sponge. So I kind of just jumped into that, finished undergrad, went back home to Sacramento, and I started working, you know, I did like a regular person job, non-art based, you know, was doing something for like a city council person, interning there. And then I got this opportunity to work at the Crocker Art Museum. Oh, which wow. Amazing. Yeah, doing this like block party project, it's called Block by Block. So basically we picked, uh, there were eight locations where folks were not actually engaging with the institution. And then they took those places and we hosted these large block parties, right? That resulted in, you know, these, three to 5,000 people experiences. And, you know, we amplified and highlighted all of the artists that lived in those areas. So it was very uh, social practice based. So anyways, did that, uh, moved to Los Angeles for grad school and, you know, had all these grad school experiences. <laughs> and, um, you know, kind of now I'm here, I guess you could that that is a wild journey. So, so just kind of a summary, you focused on business for the first three years of undergrad and yeah. then senior years when you're just like, no, I've like dream deferred. I'm going to take all these art classes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I took every art class that I could that was available and that fit into my schedule. And then the ones that didn't, like I said, maybe sometimes I would show up unannounced. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it was all really for, um, yeah, the love of art. Wow, that is an that's an incredible story, and I love that you know your work through the museum. Our friends over at the Crocker, um, really, you know, it, it sounds like that that's what really solidified it for you. Um, and and you know, and I would even I would even say because there's there's so much social context to your work. Um, you know, that, that almost feels like that, that whole act of going out into the community um, and, you know, doing this block party uh, may, maybe has some resonances in the work that you do. Maybe not direct, but. <laughs> well, I, I definitely like to think about things on like a large scale. So how will this be perceived by many people or most people or what is the most, um, on the ground understanding of something. Mm. So the most basic elementary understanding that we kind of have, at least in America, um, that definitely influences the work because, you know, then there's a lot of like slippage and it gets really mm. complicated because these things are supposed to be ideas or values that we hold and quote unquote know to be true, know to be matter of fact. And so many of them, as we've seen, are either being uh, changed, manipulated, pulled apart, stretched. And um, yeah, that definitely is kind of part of the art practice is highlighting and emphasizing that. That is awesome.
I want to um, I want to jump into showing some of your pieces so we can kind of talk about them and I'm going to just go directly to your website. Sure. Um, so let's just see. There's no videos on this right so how can people are, are you see, you're seeing the website right I can see it. Okay, cool, 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 cool. I like this thing. It, so, sometimes it shows the wrong, I have two screens. Sometimes it shows the wrong screen. So I just want to make sure. <laughs> it close out all windows. That are exactly, gone. exactly. Um, and so, you know, this first piece, and, and I, I hope you could also a little bit later give us a sneak peek into some of the, into some of the newer works. Um, but I'm super, I'm super interested in this piece again, and you know I think, you know I don't know for some of our visitors if this is the first piece, but um, that you know that they're experiencing. But this piece definitely has connections to other works. Like I can, I'm making the connection between them, right? Having having seen them, um, but the material is your 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 choice of material your approach is completely different i mean dry erase marker drawing on a wall with variable dimensions i'm super fascinated by by this concept yeah 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 so and this is kind of maybe something you touched on earlier about how people typecast sometimes artists <laughs> their like race or identity or anything their gender their sexual orientation all these things you know where you're from et cetera, et cetera. Um, and for me, I'm really interested in um, how we describe, articulate, and showcase Blackness. And where does it exist? How does it, how does it exist? Can it be you know, expanded, all these things? So I was doing a series of works that only used office supplies, because I really mm -hmm. wanted to, and this was before the pandemic, I was working on a show that was really you know, trying to talk about how Black folks maybe experience this idea of the American office space or workspace. You know, there's so many different dynamics that happen. Uh, and it's kind of a culture that's wrapped into our society, the administrative culture, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. And there's always these objects that we kind of call out or uh, attribute to those sites and locations. And, you know, the dry erase marker is kind of like the, you know, it's, all through academia, you know, it's definitely, it's like the, you know, it's the one thing that people use when they're planning, plotting, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I was thinking about how to really kind of manipulate that object. And I really landed on two things and I won't give the whole thing away because you know, <laughs> part, of, part of it is really about it being this like, you know, producing this abstract space with something that's really familiar. So, you know, it's like a giant black hole, mm. right? And it has depth, but then it has like no depth because it's, you know, drawn directly onto the wall. So it's like on a very flat two dimensional surface, but then it produces this, this like uh, the space. So mm. um, with this work, I was also really just thinking about, you know, uh, black folks, black hair, this idea of, you know, curly, coily hair and kind of how that looks. So it's a very like circular gesture that produces this sort of effect. And, you know, to me, it kind of looks like an Afro. Mm -hmm. um, and I really like that because it is kind of all of those things. And then at the same time, very flatly, it's just uh, a, a drawing on a wall. And, you know, it's kind of funny because we think of dry erase markers as something that's not permanent, but it's very permanent when you don't use it on, on the right surface. <laughs> so this idea of permanence is kind of like embedded into the work. Um, and then, yeah, you know, number seven, right? So for maybe some folks, if you go to the barber shop, you know, there's like a poster on the wall, all these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kaepernick, all these things. Anyways, so. Oh my gosh, I love it. I love it. And so, so of course, you know, I, I started to connect it with something else, but I mean, it's just something else that we'll see in, a, in just a second. But I mean, by itself, it's also beautiful. You know, it's, it's, it's like the, I think uh, it goes just the, just for the aesthetic value of it, it goes beyond um, 
the materials, you know, a wall and a dry erase marker. Um, obviously the artist touch has something to do with that as well. Um, but, you know, it's, it's something that I could look at for a long time. Was this in the gallery, like directly on, on the gallery's wall or, um, cause it so looks like this, it's textured. This iteration of the work and what's kind of interesting about it is I've done pieces like this. This is maybe the third or fourth one. Um, and you know, they're variable dimensions so they can be expanded or contracted. So you can have like a small drawing that, you know, does the same and has the same effect as this, um, you know, on like a small little rectangle. Or you mm. could take up a giant wall, you could take up a whole room. And, um, you know, for me, this work, so it was done in my studio uh, this iteration. And what's wild is that although the artist's hand is present, right, my hand is there, I think in a lot of ways that it could be done by anyone. Mm. So it's not necessarily as this like very rigid, you know, how to, for instance, like it's not using like a watercolor technique or like a wash technique. It's a very easy gesture, right? Just this, like a little circle. So um, yeah, I don't even have to actually be present for it to be made or constructed, which is <laughs> exciting, you know, and the work lives on it on its own. It had this weird eerie presence in my studio. It kind of just was always in the corner of your eye, which yeah, is, cool, yeah. you know. I love it, I love it. And for me, you know, it reminds me, I, I, I mean, maybe the placement on the website, but I immediately connect it to this piece right here. And I'm gonna try to like zoom in on this a little bit. Um, but you know, the, this, this black ball. And so, you know, again, those connections that you start making, I'm like, oh, is it, is it the same as this black ball? Um, that's, <laughs> that's being filled with glitter, which is super fascinating for me. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so one thing I am really interested in is this idea that's, you know, in science, but the visual light spectrum, right? So it's the spectrum of light and color that we kind of all see on Earth. And to me, it's really, really interesting just kind of thinking about things through that maybe mode of thinking or perspective, because, you know, it's really, really Black. And, um, you know, <laughs> you kind of get all these different things that are happening. And what's wild about this work is, you know, you can kind of go a lot of different ways with it. I was thinking about it really simply. Um, and to me, really, I wanted to maybe give people uh, a new space to experience possibility for themselves. So, I guess maybe you could say it's an American culture. I don't know if it's a global thing, but the kind of ch childhood rhyme of, uh, you know, I am rubber and you're glue, whatever you say bounces off of me and sticks to you. Oh yeah. You know, when someone's like making fun of you or like putting you down or saying something negative about you, you say that as like a response, like, well, everything you just said is actually about you and not me. So I was thinking about, well, what happens if those two things were kind of brought together? the actual rubber and the glue. And mm. then obviously, you know, thinking about it through um, like a black aesthetic, a pan African aesthetic. Well, what happens if people start to maybe talk about themselves in a way that isn't negative? And I'm not saying that black folks talk about themselves negatively or anything like that. I'm more so saying, how do we, um, you know, reimagine those, reimagine those like cultural youth euphemisms mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um and then also yeah give them kind of like a an abstraction and then yeah this is like part of the series of works that are doing office supplies um it's a it's a it's a really interesting one i really like it it's kind of it's strange I, I actually really, really love it. And, you know, just kind of as you're talking about it, it, it makes me think of all of these other things, you know, like, um, and even as you were just talking just now, just, you know, just thinking about how Black is, you know, and Western culture has been associated with so many negative things that when you are Black, sometimes you take that on, um, you know, but you know, the, I, I think even in, in more recent times, it's like the celebration of Blackness, the, 
the joy, the beauty of it, um, the living my life like I'm golden is like something that comes, you know, that definitely pops in into my head. Um, or just, you know, other folks that are just even, you know, highlighting, you know, the beauty of melanin and I don't know. Uh, it, it it for me it conjures so many different things. <laughs> totally, totally. And and you know, that I think is very much a part of this idea of when we think of the word black or blackness, mm -hmm. black people, we have all these things that kind of come into our mind, whether they're positive or negative, they're or conditioned to think about, mm -hmm. um, they're present. So, but you know, blackness is also super abstract, yeah. right? It's the amalgamation of all of these things, so. It's kind of amazing. And what's funny about this one is that the title was kind of given to me uh, by my mom. So, um, you know, I was kind of having a conversation with her one time. And, you know, maybe I was like going through something, you know, talking to a parent, like this is what's happening. And she said this, she was like, well, if you fail and hit the ground, bounce up. Yeah, to, which it. to me was a really like, powerful statement, right? For anyone. So you could try and fail and, you know, hit rock bottom or anywhere. But after that, go up, right? Mm -hmm. Don't stop there. Don't get stuck. I love that. I love that. This this comes from mama's wisdom. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> it makes yeah, it extra, yeah, yeah. extra special. Um, and then we have, okay, so so this is this thing about you that I just I just appreciate. I think um, you know, this this mastery of multiple materials and also kind of um not you don't seem to worship any material right like most painters are just like i'm obsessed with paint there's no other you know there, there, there's there's nothing else um that i could possibly ever work with to make to make art and you know same way that photographers tend to you know, you fully immerse yourself in the world of photography and that's your thing and everything else is everything else right um but you don't necessarily you don't see that the the material it, it almost feels like the material falls in secondary to the concept that you want to convey right and so if the concept or the idea that you are thinking about calls for photography or calls for vellum or you know rubber bands and then, then that's where you go and I and I think that's something that I find extraordinarily fascinating about your um your practice and, and makes me especially love it um so this one I know we, we've got two different angles in it so this is the the front view and then the side view that we can see the layering um a little bit more and please tell me about this piece yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, this work is uh, Black Body Radiation 1. And it's, uh, it's a really interesting one. So uh, it's been shown. So it was shown at Residency Art Gallery, which is in Inglewood. So shout out to Rick and the folks at Residency. They're super amazing. They're always putting on really interesting shows, really amazing people. And if you're ever in Los Angeles, definitely go to Residency. Uh, yeah, they're, they're great. Um, but this work was all about the idea of black body radiation. So I kind of got that uh, terminology from, you know, it's like a study in astrophysics. And it's basically um, how we get visual light on this planet. And it really mm. emphasizes and talks about how the sun works. So the actual, you know, sun like out there in outer space. And um, essentially, some folks would quote the sun as a perfect black body. And I guess a quick rundown of black body radiation is all of these sort of uh, radio waves, light and energy are falling on an object. So we can imagine like, you know, my hand is like a black circle or something. And it's constantly absorbing that energy and taking it in. And what happens is so that, you know, for instance, the sun or any sort of black body, so that it doesn't overheat, it mm. expels the energy that it is, you know, constantly consuming. 
and it produces this white light. So, you know, the idea of white light actually comes from a black space. Um, and from that white light, we kind of get visual light on our planet. And then obviously, you know, the light that happens on our planet also goes through all these different things such as, um, I believe it's called like Raleigh lighting. So it's like these little chemicals that are in the atmosphere that make the light that we see blue, right? That's kind of mm. where you get the blue sky. Um, so I was kind of taking the language of black body radiation, which is again, kind of all about the visual light spectrum. And I was applying it to black people, black bodies, primarily myself, um, and thinking about, uh, you know, policing in America or just like black people encountering uh, all of the different social hurdles that uh, we experience. And um, I was thinking about it in kind of a poetic way. So maybe policing or just, you know, the violence that happens to people is because they're giving off this sort of like life, life force mm. energy. And that has to be uh, captured, expelled, terminated, all the words you want to use. And also, you know, this is kind of how we see things. This is actually how it works on like a scientific level. So I was really trying to like reverse engineer that. And I wanted to reverse engineer it to then talk about how language constructs our understanding of ourselves and society. So it, it's kind of hard to see in the photographs. Uh, I mean, the photos on the website are all right, but um, you have to really see it in person because the mm -hmm. work really actually requires natural light to work. So, you know, all of the different color combinations and text combinations produce this almost like hologram-like image. And yeah, but it's, you know, these transparency, two pieces of transparency, some T-pins. Um, yeah, and it's kind of this weird ghostly-like thing. It's pretty amazing. I really, really like this work. I can I, I I can tell, and you know, you, you're referencing um, kind of these uh, scientific, <laughs> you know, terms and uh, phenomena. Are, is are you an avid reader of uh, science? <laughs> uh, you know what's kind of wild is it's always just really exciting to return back to the really basic things in the world. Mm. So like, uh, you know, this isn't for anyone, but just for yourself or whatever, like how does electricity work? You know, yeah. it's something that we like know or think about and just like agree upon that it exists, but like, how does it actually happen? Did Frederick Douglass actually go out there with, a, with like a kite and like a key or, you know, all these things. So, you know, I, I kind of run up against that in a lot of you know, the thought process that goes into making the works. And oftentimes, you know, and maybe I didn't get a chance to answer this question, but I am not necessarily super invested in, well, I guess I could say this, I'm actually very invested in words and language. Mm. And I think that is a metaphor and all of those other things that kind of give it's almost like a launching pad for the works, you know? And I think a lot of times it also informs what materials get used and it's, you know, so I think with this one, yeah, I was like, well, I'm really into Afrofuturism. I'm really into outer space. I want to understand maybe how, how a lot of these things work. And, um, you know, you stumble upon these uh, embedded metaphors, like, wow, so black body radiation is this thing. I wonder if it's also about black bodies. Yeah, and yeah. Then, you know, kind of go from there. That is that, that's incredible. I love that. I love that. And now I'm like, I want to see it in real life and I want to see it on a giant scale, even. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's, and, you know, that's kind of something that I encountered with making that work is can it be larger? So, you know, that kind of just more so goes into like manufacturing and mm -hmm, all that. Exactly. Yeah. This is, this is a good one. Um, so, so this one's real kind of interesting. 
Uh, I'm also really into light and space, right? Just as like a part of my art practice. I think it's really, really significant and profound. And, you know, it's definitely something that was going on in Los Angeles. Um, and, you know, we can expand on that because so many things incorporate light and space in our world. Uh, and this one is, you know, um, I like history. I think history is really interesting. When I made this work, I was also working on this whole series about history, kind of asking what happens if the month of February never ends. Mm -hmm. And this is somewhat of an extension of that, um, but it's weird. So I do two different things that are, I don't know why I'm saying it like that, but like, so I make uh, black paintings and then white paintings. Ah, so, okay. So it's kind of weird. So the white paintings are usually embedded into the wall, like a fresco. Um, and then the black paintings are very three-dimensional present. Um, so this is kind of one of the black paintings that I've made. And with this work, I really just wanted to talk about what do we think is worthwhile in celebrating? How do we celebrate? How do holidays get established? Um, what do we know about the people who are these like iconic figures in our world? Um, and then kind of also just running up onto this image on the internet and being incredibly like blown away. So obviously this is right after Martin Luther King was assassinated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I believe this is that the original photograph because this is like painted over it. But the original photograph was at like a sanitation plant and uh, got it. sanitation workers made these these posters right and they were like boom it's a black holiday right so it's kind of kind of powerful to see like folks immediately take up agency in their lives especially in response to you know in a, a political assassination and all these other things um and you know just kind of how we think about um Martin Luther King, he has like a Christ-like presence for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. uh, although Christmas is not necessarily just about uh, religion now, you know, there's a lot of commercialization and a lot of um, iconography that makes us think about holidays, but we don't necessarily think about where those things come from. So yeah, it's kind of like a light drawing. Although I, you know, I would maybe differentiate that but yeah. <laughs> it's, well, it's, I'm it's drawing, so it's kind of oh, weird do you uh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. so i you know what, what i just really love about this I, I love the questions that you're posing to yourself um and how then the question then creates the work or the, or the question leads into into the creation of the work yet you're still not answering the question you know it's it's like you're posing it and and there, there, there's something for us to kind of go off of on but you're not telling us what to think at, at, the, at the end of that you're not you're not being like well <laughs> king was killed in april uh and so now everyone take this you know take this holiday like you, how does this come about um you know who who creates the holiday? Who de who determines that it's worth um, taking and, and worth honoring? Um, and again, but but there's no definitive answer that that you're trying to spoon feed us. No, I I really want to make works that, and I want to, but I do make works that are open ended, because um, I think this is maybe something that happened in grad school. Uh, the word didactic got tossed around mm. a lot. This is really didactic. <laughs> this is didactic. didactic. Um, and for people who maybe are like, what, what, what does the word didactic mean? It kind of basically means it's like a, like a call and response, like a direct answer. Mm -hmm. So like a drawing of one plus one equals two would be really didactic. because you. <laughs> so um, I really want to make works that people can kind of just jump into. It's not like an answer all the time. You can go a lot of different places. It has a lot of different things that are referential. And, you know, they're, they're kind of places for people to get a little messy in their mind. Um,
And I really, really like that because I think oftentimes people think, especially with like black art and mm. maybe you slip it into something, but uh, people think it's like a one-to-one -one relationship with uh, black culture. And it's not always that, and it's not always not that. So, you know, I really just am trying to make uh, things that vacillate. They kind of write a line versus they take a hard line in one direction. That that is awesome. I'm gonna show one more piece because there's one you know with you saying that 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 uh, I definitely want to discuss. It was one of the images that we <laughs> that we used in marketing okay, this and yeah, others. Yeah. There, there's 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 so many amazing pieces, and so I can kind of like slide through them. But I, I feel like you know it would be wrong to not have a conversation <laughs> about smoking gun. Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, and you know, what's interesting is um, this work is kind of a fun one, kind of kind of wild. Um, I'll be kind of brief because I know we're getting short on time. Oh, we're but, good, um, we're good. Okay, cool, 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 dope. So like um, this work is, it's a lot, right? Um, I think maybe one thing is when I made it, uh, you know, on a very surface level, I was thinking about Tamir Rice, right? Mm. Who was murdered by the police, right? This whole idea of people who can, who has the right to play and who doesn't. Um, how do we like describe play in America? Obviously like violence is like really embedded into our culture. Um, and there's all these other things that we kind of apply to objects that make them charged, i.e. the American flag is a very charged object, but it's really just fabric and, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. shapes. And um, I was really just, yeah, who, who's actually, who has the ability to play and who doesn't? And then, you know, manufacturing has kind of gone into this work a lot. Uh, it's kind of interesting just the mechanics that went into building it. So weirdly, everything fit together. Oh, really? So, like, oh, really? So, so there's no screws or glue? No, I mean, I think like the cigarette. So the cigarette is kind of really pushed into the hole. Same thing with the flag. Um, and then, you know, obviously the toy revolver is just like, you know, your classic, you know, gun toy and then like the the, sh the coat hook i didn't know that the gun and the hook were gonna fit together like, like that it kind of just happened and it really just made me think about how many things in our everyday world are just manufactured in the same places or just somehow have some sort of like characteristics where you know even if it's through circumstance or happenstance they like work together you know it literally just clicks in so that um, is wild. So, so, so this toy gun is literally just suspended on the hook. It's there's no, you didn't attach it in any with using any other. Wow, that's wild. <laughs> so, like, if this is uh like the hook or whatever, right? Yeah, so yeah. It feels like that, and it clicks in. And oh my gosh, that's wild. It's totally solid, and you know, yeah, and it's just suspended there. And it's kind of wild, right? Because for me, what I think I like the most about the work is the hook. Um, and I'm trying to remember if I had it before I made the work or if something happened. But um, the point being is to me, it kind of looks like an elephant nose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> um, so, you know, like all the elephant metaphors. And, um, yeah, so this work was actually made in 2018. Remember and realize that I did repost this work. Uh, it was either the, can you all hear me? Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, cool. So it was either the day of or the day after, what is it, January 6th? Uh, okay. Insurrection. Okay. So I kind of, it's weird, right? <laughs> Just being an artist and thinking about all the things that are happening in contemporary times and how do we respond or how do we uh, articulate what's actually happening. Um, 
and you know, maybe it's just a little, uh, maybe that's in there too, you know? And this photograph is in my studio. Um, and yeah, it's really nice because you get this break in the column mm -hmm. that's produced by, you know, the little flag kind of shooting out. And to me, I thought that was really kind of nice because when we think about columns and this idea of democracy and, you know, um, the sort of symbols of high culture, American culture, et cetera, et cetera, they can easily be uh, subverted or, or toppled by perspective, right? How you see them, how you're looking at them and how you're kind of like bisecting them. So, and this work is hung at like adult level height. So it's okay, right it's right in your face. Yeah, that that is incredible. Yeah, it's such it's such a seemingly simple uh, piece, right? But the the meanings. I mean, even the fact that she's an American spirit cigarette. But I mean, you know, there, there's there there's there's so much meaning just behind each of the components and how you put them together and. Yeah, this photograph of of bisecting the column. Um, yeah, and, and the lights. And, yeah, great. yeah. I, I I love this piece, and you know, now I'm just like, oh my gosh, I didn't know that they just all clicked together um, seamlessly like that. So that really, I, I think, adds a whole other layer to it, and it's it's almost like it's okay. I I won't project too much onto it, but you know, th thinking about how these everyday items are manufactured and then you know you start to for me at least I start to put together like okay there's these larger systems at play that need to be decoded um and I'll leave it at that I won't I won't <laughs> I won't turn it into <laughs> yeah we don't have to turn it out all the way yeah 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 we don't, we, don't, we don't have to we don't have to take it all the take it all the way with it but you know I just I I think that just having that knowledge really change it changes it for me and makes it even more of a potent symbol. Um, so before we completely run out of time, which I am, I tend to do, um, I would love to see if, if you wouldn't mind showing us around the studio. Um, uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I could try my best. So <laughs> my studio is really large and, you know, I'm on my computer, so it's kind of clunky, but I guess, so like I said, I'm in downtown Los Angeles. Uh, this is my studio. I don't want to give too much away because yeah, some, that's okay. Some of these works haven't been seen. I mean, the one behind me is on my Instagram, um, and you know, I don't really post a lot of works on social media. Uh, hope Dimitri's still there. I'm, I'm still, I'm still here. I just wanted to, I just, I wanted everyone to be able to see you more clearly. <laughs> All right, for sure. So this work, um, so I use these, these. Uh, they're called like anti-slavery alphabet letters. Mm. And they were made kind of during abolitionist times. And they were a way to like educate folks on abolition and trying to in, in, the, in slavery in America. And, um, you know, I kind of found them on the internet, thought they were really, you know, great. And I decided to kind of color them in with uh, Mr. Sketchmarker, which is, fun and uh, problematic in a lot of ways. You know, for me, I was really interested in, you know, multiculturalism and kind of how we talk about history and how we kind of approach it. And then also on a very like simple level, which is kind of wild, but like, um, yeah, what does slavery smell like? Does it have mm. a scent? Does it have a smell? Can we uh, re-articulate maybe what that could have been? You know, does it have to be violent and grotesque? And that's not to excuse any of the actual violence that has gone on, but more so to, uh, you know, give people a different kind of outlook or perspective. So there's that work. Uh, what else can you see? Maybe if I go... <laughs> Like a, I, I see lots of plants or, uh, or, yeah, or... I, do of, I do have a lot of plants um this thing right here so this is kind of, kind of like a, an installation that i did um and they're all of these like paper airplanes oh and, wow yeah it's actually the program or like a, a replica of one of the programs 
that was produced when King was assassinated. So, uh, you know, post funerals. And, you know, I was really just thinking about, again, multiculturalism, how we see these people, how we approach them, how can we um, kind of expand how we, how we talk about them, um, how information is delivered, all these things. Mm. So, um, that's pretty much it. There's some other works, but my studio's a little wild. Um, <laughs> also, you know, just, yeah, 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 yeah. So, most new works are on, they'll either be on my website or they'll be on my Instagram page. Okay, and, um, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and today, can you also put, put the, the link for the Instagram uh, site in there? Um, thanks so much. You're on it, as always. Um, so yeah, I just, I, 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 uh, I want to hear a little bit more about your process. You know, how do you, you, you kind of talked about with the, um, with the, uh, what was it called again? The black body radiation and, yeah. and kind of reading text and then leading into some, some kind of interrogation, um, which then, but the, the work is a little different than that. Um, you know, so, so it's not, it's not as, as simple as that. So, you know, if you would, if you could, if you could break down a little bit of your process, like how you go about um, conceiving of the pieces and imagining them before you, you go to execution. Yeah, they kind of happen. They kind of just happen. <laughs> I, I knew you were going to say that. So, <laughs> Well, I'm just being honest. Like, sometimes I'm just like in the store and I'm like, oh, wow, you know, that's a great one. And um, I think usually it is, and this is something maybe I learned from Duchamp or would maybe, mm. whatever. Uh, you know, <laughs> great guy. But um, he... There's a quote in a book about him that says he was really interested in artworks that, you know, how do I put this? He basically said, if you have the thought of the artwork in your mind, it's already done. Mm. So, you, so you've already made the work once you think about it, which is kind of like, you know, wow. So where does the art actually begin? Where does it end? Uh, which is which should be prioritized, the actual seeing of it, all these things. Um, so I kind of think of, I use that kind of way of thinking to make the works that I make. So once I think about it, I'm kind of like, okay, how do I want to display that? And sometimes it's like an installation. So it, it takes on multiple forms mm -hmm. to talk about one subject. Sometimes it's all loaded into one thing, one object. Um, it's really hard to say, if there's like a specific material, I think I challenge myself in a lot of ways and go, okay, well, what can you do with just a basketball hoop, right? Because people love to make works about hoops. So mm -hmm. could you, <laughs> what could you do differently? Or what could you do to add to that conversation? Um, all different types of things. You know, I've really been working on works about ice like frozen water interesting <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. and i'll just leave it at that because you know there's so much slippage but um but just thinking about like okay what does it mean if you know ice doesn't exist on earth like what does it mean if there is no ice right so take it how you want um and just things like that right really just hitting on how people read the words and hear them, how they sound, what do they mean? Metaphor is really big for me mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. it's easy to approach, people like it. And also it's, it's really, it's kind of dangerous. There's a lot of slippage for folks. You could, uh, you know, the American flag is like a really big one, right? It has all these symbols and energy and ideas embedded into it. Uh, but when you really start to unpack it, it literally unravels. So, yeah, yeah. You know, they just kind of flash into the mind. 
That's 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 awesome. I love that. Seven up no ice, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So like, you know, maybe that in itself is like a political gesture, right? So if you go to McDonald's and you order a Sprite no ice, mm-hmm, hey, mm-hmm. you know, like Ice isn't always available in other countries, right? If you go to Europe, you're not going to get any ice in your drink because it takes so much energy to actually produce it. So then, you know, but it's all in the words. Exactly, exactly. And then obviously ice, especially Clarissa, capitalized ice. (laughs) Well, yeah, yeah. Right, so you have like a government entity that (laughs) up this thing that's so basic. Ice is like essentially our environment, right? You know, we've got the North Pole and the South Pole covered in ice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But now ice has all these other meanings. And isn't that kind of like disappointing in a lot of ways? Because Oh, it is. It It is. Oh, yes. It's like it's like them calling the uh, Middle Eastern um, uh, militant group ISIS, which I'm like, come on. How do you take our the goddess of love? It turned it into something evil, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you know, that's also something that's really interesting is a lot of things, especially in like uh, blackness, have been attributed to like negative things. Mm-hmm. And I'm always really interested in that because on a fundamental level, it isn't actually that. And it could actually be seen as so many other different things, you know? that's kind of also what was a part of that black body, black body radiation work because, all right, well, if you understand how the sun works and if the sun is a perfect black body, yeah. what does that mean for black people or just blackness in general, right? Because we all get life and energy from the sun, this black object, and it produces a white light. So where mm-hmm. does whiteness come from? Yeah, yeah. I love that, I love that. <laughs> Um, you you talked to, you t- you spoke of a little bit about Duchamp. Um, yeah, mind talking about any of your other um, you know ar- artists that you that you look up to or or find inspiration in? Yeah, um, you know, I try not to do the name calling thing because <laughs> well, just because there's so many amazing people who've done a lot of really groundbreaking things that definitely do more people need to know about. I mean, obviously you could talk about all of the, you know, LA object folks, right? So yeah, yeah. um, all those people are super, super amazing. You know, um, I really am into like Senga Naguti. I think her work is really amazing. Um, Definitely into Lorna Simpson, people like that. Um, Chris Burden's kind of cool. Marcel Duchamp is great. Uh, Jessica Stockholder. I go on and on and on. But I I think a lot of it uh, is Ulysses Jenkins, right? David Hammonds, all those people. Uh, Charles White, you know. Wow, so so you just named a very diverse, very, very diverse group. (laughs) uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I think a lot of times we get caught up in like, well, I'm either going to try to be like this person. Mm -hmm, You know, mm -hmm. Bell's really amazing. I really like his work. Um, Felix Gonzalez Torres is also super amazing. Mm. Um, Yeah, there's so many people. I could keep going, but, you know, I don't want to keep adding. Yeah, yeah. Really, I think what it is is, um, I, I maybe I'm like a responder at this point in the game because uh, contemporary art's really interesting. We're like post, 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 so many different things. So right. what's new? <laughs> um, you know, and I, I, I have and do make works that are new or maybe push these conversations, but I'm also actually really 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 interested in messing with um set definitions so mm-hmm. we kind of, we're talking about this about like what does it mean to be a black artist so that was something that was really big for me in grad school I really wanted to talk about um what we think of as black art and how it should look and all these other things who does it how it's made so I actually for my thesis show had like a two-person show with mm. this guy named Tyrone Green 
Uh, I saw that one. Yeah, yeah. But like, if you, you know, if you do the, if you do a little Google search, uh, you'll figure out that like Tyrone Green isn't actually like a real person. Uh, he's a, I'm giving it away, but you know, whatever. So he's like, um, he's a character on SNL, it's Eddie Murphy. And it's Eddie Murphy playing an artist, like a black artist uh, guy, right? Uh -huh. He does all these like assemblage s like conceptual works. So I thought it would be really interesting to uh, have a show that is, you know, literally taking up the idea of what is a black artist supposed to make, and how did those, how would those looks appear? So you know, a lot of double consciousness really kind of integrated through all of the pieces. And then, yeah, it's like people think, you know, this is like a two person show and there's actually only one person involved. That is wild. And I saw that too. And I was like, I was like, it, it also said like artist and felon. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Which is like how he's introduced in, the, uh, in like the sketch. And it's kind of, it's a really nice sketch because, you know, if I ever get the opportunity, um, you know, I want to talk to, you know, Eddie Murphy about this, like, cause they drop so many art, like tidbits. Uh, you know, I think the gallery he's represented by is like Felice Sloan Duchamp gallery. So <laughs> there's all these things kind of embedded into the episode that I thought were uh, really great. So yeah, I'm mostly interested in complicating the idea of black art. Mm. Which I think you do a brilliant job at. I'm I'm so into it. I love it. Um, Thank you. Kind of, you know, and this what's 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 coming up for you? Um, when when are when are your next shows? Where can we see your work? I know you said some of it's going to come to the website and and social media, but where now that the world is opening back up, you know, I, I hope folks can actually go see it um, in real life. So, yeah, do, do you have any of those you can share? I mean, I have some things definitely coming in the pipeline. Some of them I cannot share. <laughs> Understood. But mostly uh, the works are outside. The wow. works have the gallery at this moment. And a lot of them are in the streets. So the only way you can kind of see them is if you see them in Los Angeles or wherever else they're made. And um, you know, maybe sometime down the line in the future, you'll see like a photograph. But I think the reason for that is, you know, I, I'm tr I've been trying this whole time not to really critique uh, the apparatuses that we have and use right now to like talk about art or showcase artists. You know, one of them primarily being like social media platforms. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's just for me, kind of trying to unplug from the internet right trying to really give some distance between me and this machine that is like uh you know producing crunching and kind of processing all all of us right and all of the work that we all do and i think sometimes it does a disservice to art because mm -hmm. you know so many things could happen you could make something really amazing you get like five likes and then people don't think you're worth anything, right? Or like, <laughs> it's true. Likes, and people think you're like the greatest person ever, which there's nothing wrong with that. But I think what it does is it, people aren't actually looking and experiencing artwork the same way you do like in a gallery or in a mm -hmm. museum, where you slow down, you take your time, all these things. But it's also just to make it a little more exciting for myself, you know? Maybe it's not just something on a wall or on the ground. It's actually engaging people where they're at and maybe also empowering them in a lot of ways. So, so I'm, I'm, su I'm super interested in this. So say it's, it, it doesn't seem like there, there's a map or there, there's a lo single location that one can go to, to be like, oh, this is the route for me to go see the Lorenzo uh, Baker pieces. So right now, is is it like, you know, I just happened to walk down, I don't know, Lamert, and and <laughs> and I just happened upon this piece um, that feels like a Lorenzo Baker, or is is is, is this okay? Okay. 
you know, like, you know, I guess no two, no two Picassos are supposed to look alike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yet they do. Um, so like, what is a Lorenzo Baker is a really interesting question for me. And then um, maybe it doesn't even have to be about me. I guess I could say this, the last one that I made is on um, 36 and Western. So mm -hmm. if you're in Los Angeles, 36 and Western, if you see it, you see it. If you don't, you don't. I can't guarantee that it's even there anymore. You know? Wow, so, wow. Yeah. And all, and then obviously, you know, I have some other things kind of coming down the pipeline. Um, there's a video work that I've been working on. So I'll, I'll be showcasing that and that'll be like a little quasi scheduled in-person thing, you know, just given mm -hmm. all the coronavirus uh, things that are happening that are very serious. So, um, and then, you know, there's so, it's hard to really say that it's just this one show or this one thing um, anymore. It's a lot of different things. So, but but uh, but if I go to your social media, can I kind of get get some hints when things do drop? Is that? <laughs> yeah, 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 sure, right. I think that's probably my most immediate place. Okay. Um, and yeah, yeah, yeah. That'll probably hit hit the Instagram. Check the website. Um, you know go to Los Angeles, California. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I will be taking, I will be taking a trip and I'm sure others will too. Um, yeah. Lorenzo, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time with us today. Uh, really appreciate you, love your work. And I can't wait to um, come across some of it in the near future. <laughs> Thank you. This has been amazing and an honor. Yes, yes, same here, same here. Um, good luck with everything. Um, and I know I'm like, I'm gonna have to do a studio visit or something next time in, I'm, I'm in LA. Yeah. <laughs> we won't broadcast it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right, well, have such a great one. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you everyone. If you joined us a little bit late, um, just so you know, this conversation will be um, immediately available on Moad's Facebook channel um, and then by next week, before the end of next week, it'll also be on our YouTube channel. Thanks so much, Lorenzo. Have a beautiful day and everyone, we'll see you next time. Peace. All Wear right, masks. Take care. Wear masks, yes, and get vaccinated. <laughs> Have a good one. Bye.